Next up, we have a presentation from Martin Holland, Managing Director of Cobra Limited with the ticker code CBE. I will now hand you over to Martin for more on their copper projects in Botswana and Western Australia. Great. Thanks, Jane. Um, great. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, in regards to Cobre, it's a Spanish word for copper, so it's pretty clear what we're focused on. Um, and also talking about the beginning of the copper super cycle, so we can change to the next page. Thanks, Jane. Great. So from a capital structure perspective, we got around about 156 million shares in issue. Um, we have a market cap at the moment of around about $25 million. Um, we have cash in bank um, circa around $10 million. We're still owed around $1.4 million from our largest shareholder being Metal Tiger, um, which is uh, due to be paid at our next EGM or, or AGM. Uh, we have four projects. Um, though on this presentation today, I'm going to focus only on, on the Kalahari Metals project, which is based in Botswana. Uh, from the board of directors, uh, as myself as executive chairman and uh, also managing director, Andrew Sassine as finance director, Michael McNeely as non-executive director, and Michael Addison as non-executive director. So the, the, there's two words here you don't often see together, um, one being diversified and the next being focused. Uh, so we're diversified um, across jurisdictions, so being in, in Australia, Western Australia, uh, and also in Africa. Um, and we're also diversified uh, across the type of copper as well. So we've got the HMS in Western Australia targeting a sedimentary hosted copper uh, in Botswana uh, and also copper, nickel, magmatic sulphides in Gabon, which is on the border of the Congo Craton, um, though we are focused on the commodity copper. So here it uh, shows a clear path to $15,000 a tonne. We've seen a big increase in copper price over the last period. We set this company up a couple of years ago with a view that, uh, that the demand and the supply was out of whack. Um, there's also a move here from a no decarbonisation without copper, a green transition without a surge in copper demand. Um, a, a copper market is, is also unprepared for this critical uh, role and the sticky supply threatens to deplete copper stocks by mid-decade. So we believe that, it's, uh, that we're in a pretty good uh, space and commodity of, um, of choice here. And uh, yeah, I'll start focusing here on Botswana. So there's a joint venture that we started uh, in April of this year. Um, there was an extensive amount of groundwork that happened. Uh, due to COVID, we had to hire experts such as CSA Global to do site visits for us and, um, and, and to write certain technical reports. Uh, this was all completed, this joint venture in April of 2021. Um, and we've just recently uh, had a joint venture with Metal Tiger, which is also Cobra's largest shareholder. They're a natural resource fund dual listed on AIM and ASX, uh, and they own roughly around 20% of Cobre. Uh, we're in a 51, 49% joint venture with them, and we're the operating controller of the Kalahari Metals Limited Company, which owns approximately about 8,000 square kilometres of the land in, on, on the Kalahari Copper Belt. Uh, we've approved a 7,000 metre drilling program, uh, which is our first drilling program as a joint venture. Uh, and this program is drilling uh, pretty much adjacent to Zone 5, T3 and A4 um, areas, which has been uh, discovered by Tribute Canyon uh, and also Sandfire. And interestingly, the Matheo project T3 has recently been permitted um, and ready to be uh, turned into a mine. So we've got sort of got, you know, like two mines in the making here over the next sort of 12 to 24 months. A uh, strong investment from both the business sector in mine development and government in power infrastructure. So the power lines are already up at, at present. Um, and this is uh, all aimed at opening up the Kalahari Copper Belt in Botswana. Uh, we've got diamond drilling and RC drilling is underway on our project, which I'll take you through. Uh, in regards to the Kalahari Copper Belt, uh, uh, the view here is that the belt is still largely underexplored. So the Kalahari Copper Belt remains immature in terms of discovery and metal endowment. Uh, so most our deposits that were found historically were found on traditional limb hosted on the main redux contact. And what we're focusing at trying to find are these near surface domes, which are open pitable. Um, so we believe that there is uh, room to find another large deposit in, on, this, uh, on this belt. So you can see here in the light green, the land holding that we own, it's, it's quite extensive. We have circa 8,100 square kilometres of the belt, which makes us the second largest land holder in the district outside of Sandfire. Um, which puts us at around about one third of the Kalahari Copper Belt in, in total. Uh, you can see here that this is a budget that we approve. We're going to be drilling all the way through the year. We've approved a 7,000 metre uh, diamond and RC drilling program. Um, we've just announced we've completed the first 2,000 metres of drilling. 
uh, and and will continue to uh, drill throughout the the year. Historically, our largest shareholder being Metal Tiger and also a joint venture partners spent around $5 million on geophysical surveys, soil sampling, drill target development, and successful proof of concept drilling and development of, of current drill programs. So a lot of that early hard work and time consuming work has already been completed, um, which is a good position for us um, you know, as, as a company entering into the joint venture, uh, having all that knowledge. So we're now moving ahead with advanced exploration of the, of the area. Um, some sort of results that have been found in the district, which are just adjacent to where we're drilling at the moment, um, which was announced recently by Sandfire, was circa 35 metres at 7% copper and 116 grams silver, uh, and 12 metres at 13.3% copper. So you can see that there is high-grade nature in this belt um, and also at near surface, which is quite exciting, considering that we're exploring targets that are very similar to that as our neighbours. So getting into a bit of technical you know, sort of analysis here, uh, historically, exploration has focused um, on the redux contact and the, and the mineralization of fold limbs, so very deep drilling, and that's what sort of like Kubrick Canyon had discovered. Um, these are easier to find using magnetic AEM and soil sampling, but at the end can be deep and not suited to lower cost open pit mining. It obviously helps having the copper price higher, so they do become economic, but we are looking to find high grade deposits near the surface for open pit is our strategy. So recent exploration um, is focused on fold-related anticline hinge zones and structurally controlled trap sites higher in the strap um, above the traditional redox zone. So it's very similar to that as uh, A4 and, uh, and T3. So historically, um, in 2020, uh, we completed around, as a, as a company, 1,700 metres of strap drilling. Uh, so some deep holes that we drilled there, 3,000 metres of soil sampling, um, which showed some copper and zinc anomalies above the targets that we've defined. We've had these targets you know, being structurally designed and completed by experts that have already been involved in discoveries on the belt, which gives us a lot of confidence. Um, I, have, I have mentioned our largest shell being Metal Tiger. They were involved um, with a company called Mod Resources, which they owned roughly around 30% of, um, which was bought out by Sandfire for around about $170 million a few years back now. Um, so they have a lot of knowledge on this belt and we, and we have that technical team working with us now to find the next discovery in the area. So this is the planned uh, drilling program that we have here. Um, we started out with a plan of a thousand meters of diamond drilling and 4,000 meters of RC to start off with then moving to 7,000 meters in total. Um, we've been a bit slow going um, from an RC perspective. So we've had a few problems with that rig um, in the over, over the last sort of seven weeks. So we've been, you know, occurring a slow meter rate from RC perspective. So from that basis, we've actually shifted another diamond rig in. So we're increasing the amount of diamond holes that we're drilling now on meters um, and decreasing the amount of RC holes. Um, th th this has just got to do with the terrain um, more than anything else. So the diamond holes are, are working at the moment and we're getting through approximately about 30 meters a day. So we'll have some information out on the targets that we're, that we're drilling in due course. So this is quite interesting, this, this area. Um, this area itself has never had any past historic drilling. Um, this is a priority target for us. It's, it's very similar to that, again, as A4. It's very large. You're talking like 20 kilometres long target. There could possibly be multiple domes inside this target area. Um, we've just announced that we've um, drilled through the first layer, which has, has modelled up identically to the geophysics that we completed and the aeromagnetical work that's been completed. And there's two sort of important uh, geological structures that you need to identify um, on this belt, um, one being the Dakar formation and the next being the NPF. Um, and in the earlier stages of the, of the drill hole, which are only through sort of 40 to 50 metres of this um, first hole that we've drilled, we've identified the Dakar, which is you know, quite critical to find that near surface. So that's, uh, this area has already been de-risked from a target perspective. Um, and now we continue with further exploration, knowing that we're in the right geology. So from a, a targeting perspective here, you can see on the on the left what the domes look like uh, at uh, at Sandfire at A4, and you can also see the domes that we're drilling um, here um, on, on on the larger image, and they're almost identical to that as our as our neighbours. So as I said, very very large targets, um, very large sort of sedimentary hosted copper deposits that we're looking to discover here. Um, and quite high grade, considering that the world grade of, of copper being mined at the moment is less than half a percent. We're looking at um, 
at, at finding deposits that are greater than 2%, which is you know, quite attractive in this current copper market. So why the Kalahari Copper Belt? I think there's a standout quote here is that the Kalahari Copper Belt was rated as number one in the world for most prospective underdiscovered sedimentary hosted copper deposits by the US Geological Survey. So in my opinion, if you're going to explore anywhere in the world for copper, um, it's probably a good place to start, being the Kalahari Copper Belt. Our deposits are often giant, so more than one third of the known sedimentary hosted copper deposits are greater than 500,000 tonnes and contain greater than of grades greater than 1%. So as I said, we're targeting greater than 2%. Um, and a significant portion of the Kalahari Copper Belt is hosted in Botswana. So a very safe jurisdiction in Africa. It's rated um, approximately around 12th in the, in the world at the moment on the Fraser Institute. So a very solid jurisdiction to be in to find a new large discovery. Now, the technical team here is very strong. It's led by Adam Woolridge. We also have Dr. Ross McGowan. Um, I'll, I'll touch on Ross quickly. He got the award, which was the Lindsay Award for the discovery of Kamoa, which is Ivanhoe's main project, which Robert Friedland now runs. Um, so he's on our, on our team. David Cattrall, Thomas Rogers uh, as well. So this uh, team itself has had a lot of knowledge, multi-decades of experience on the Kalahari Copper Belt. So um, we're very confident with the team that we have to discover the next deposit in this region. So from a news flow perspective, at 2020, we did a lot of the earlier work. At 2021, we've, as I said, finalised our, our joint venture. We're well funded. We just raised uh, circa around $7 million at 17 cents per share. We have around $10 million in the bank. It's a joint venture, so every dollar we spend, our, our joint venture partner spends as well. So we have a lot of money to put towards exploration moving forward. So from a news flow perspective, we'll have our results out at Kit East on the endurance and perseverance targets, also Kit West. So we'll have ongoing you know, exploration over the next period um, and, uh, and, and plenty of news flow to come. And that's, uh, that's a wrap. Well, Marty, thank you for the presentation. Um, certainly very interesting, particularly with the proximity to Sandfire. Um, we've had a few questions that have come through, which I know you did cover, but I will ask them anyway. So uh, how many rigs have you got currently drilling? Yes, I currently have three rigs on site at the moment, Jane. So we have two to start off with, and we've just had another one uh, turn up last week. And I know, again, you did sort of mention this, but um, when are you expecting assays due? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll probably just also, also touch back on, on that rig question. Uh, Sandfire have approximately 15 rigs in operation at the moment. Um, they're using a company called Discovery, um, and we're also using the same company, Discovery. So we have a three of their rigs as well. From an assay perspective, um, what we're doing is, is we're actually drilling the hole with diamond core. Um, it takes a few days for the core to dry. Um, once the core is dry, then we XRFing it on site. Uh, if, if there is any economic grade that comes from the XRF, we then send it to the lab for assays. Um, so that's that's the current position that we're currently in. We've only completed 2,000 metres of drilling at, at, at present. Um, so we'll have yeah, a further news flow in the, in the coming weeks um, and more throughout the year. Brilliant. Well, thank you for joining us today, Martin. Great. Thanks, Jane. I appreciate it.